Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Alexandru Baltag and Sonia Smith to our deep seminar today. Sonia and Alexandru are both from UPA and both are deep affiliates. They have done extensive work on formal systems for uh, modeling and reasoning about quantum systems. And today they're going to talk about a logical perspective on Wigner's brand. The floor is yours. Well, thanks for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Uh, so I'll present the first part of the talk, the introduction, and then Alexander takes over. And we hope to finish in time because we made, as usual, many, many slides. Um, okay, Logic meets Wigner's plan. This is an overview of what we present. So first I talk about the idea of observations in quantum theory. And then we introduce the paradoxes, Wigner's friends, and uh, some epistemic principles. When I use the word epistemic, it refers to knowledge. And then I present some of the general ideas of other solutions in the literature. And then finally, we come to our solution with the paradoxes. OK, so first, um, about the observers in quantum theory. So the, the observer enters quantum theory via the measurement process. Uh, Heisenberg and von Neumann they specify that any such process requires us to specify in advance what the system is and what the observer is. So in the literature, you will see this being referred to as the Heisenberg of the Monarch cut. So we are obliged to divide the world in two parts. That's explicitly what von Neumann writes in his 1932 uh, volume, his axiomatic theory of quantum mechanics. We divide the world in two parts, one being the observed system, the other one being the observer. In the former, we can follow all the physical processes, at least in principle, arbitrarily precisely. In the later, latter, that is meaningless. The boundary between the two, where we place the cup, is arbitrary to a very large extent. Okay, so that's what von Neumann writes. Now, if you move the cut, far into the perceptual apparatus of the observer, then you get the combination of a physical system S under observation and the measurement apparatus, I can call it M. And I can well describe both together, the combined system of the system and the measurement apparatus M. And I describe it as the evolution of S and M together, and I do that using the unitary dynamics of quantum theory. Now, if you use quantum theory to describe the evolution of M, S plus M system plus measurement apparatus, then we know that the input and output variables of what we're measuring uh, of the whole measurement process become entangled. But that's what the unitary evolution does. It entangles um, the system plus the measurement apparatus. This actually prevents us from extracting a definite measurement outcome from the measurement apparatus. It's not clear at the end to read, to say what exactly is the measurement outcome at the end. This is known in philosophical literature and quantum foundations as the measurement problem. There is a solution to that. Von Neumann wrote in his volume that also according to the Copenhagen interpretation, we should look at the duality of two processes. There is process one, as he calls it in his, uh, in its volume. Process one describes what happens during a measurement, and process two describes the unitary evolution of a quantum system. Process one corresponds to what happens in a measurement, so describes a collapse, or higher interpretation is a collapse interpretation. Process two is just the unitary evolution of a quantum system, and that is given by Schrodinger's equation. That's how we describe the unitary evolution of a quantum system. Okay, so we have two processes to describe what happens to the system. Now, as long as we talk about a single measurement and a single observer who's measuring a system, then it is clear when to apply process one and when to apply process two. So there is no big fuss about, no uncertainty about what to do. So the Heisenberg von Neumann cut was imposed for situations where we have single observers. Now the question appears, what do we do when we have multiple observers? Quantum formalism is silent 
about how to apply the formalism, including the cut and including process one and process two, to scenarios where we have more observers. And this was uh, observed by Wigner in his paper in 1961. But Moiran in his book, in the very last paragraph of his book, he refers to the idea of multiple observers. He says that his theory should apply there, but he doesn't work it out. He says it's left open to the reader. So it doesn't really give us any intuition, nor any principle of how to apply quantum mechanics to the idea when we have multiple observers. So, so can, I, yeah. can I ask a quick question that just pops in my mind? I mean, uh, how does uh, the Schrodinger cat fit into this? Do you yeah, to we are coming there. Okay. Yeah. 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 Schrodinger's cat is a special case. Right. Okay. Okay. Wigner's friend. So, so we come to these thought experiments. So now we're going to look exactly at the case where we have multiple observers or where we are going to observe also an observer that can be a microscopic or a system that can be bigger than just a quantum system. So we are look at Wigner's friend's thought experiment, 1961, proposed variations by it. So David Deutsch has a version of it. Bruckner has several versions and the latest version is the Froerich and Renner paradox from 90, uh, 2018. And they have shaken up the debates on the foundations of quantum theory, and Schrodinger's cat will be a special case of one of these. So these thought experiments aim to show that if quantum theory is assumed to be universally valid and hence can be applied to complex systems that are composed of quantum systems as well as their classical observers, classical observer there could be the cat, right? Then different agents are rationally entitled to ascribe different pure states to the same system. And as a result, they cannot share their information in a consistent way. Okay. So the last paradox that I mentioned, the FR, Hollinger-Renner paradox, that result is stated in the format of no-go theorem stating that any theory that satisfies these three conditions will necessarily lead to a contradiction. So, our three principles, Q stands for the universal validity of quantum theory, C stands for the consistency of agents and their predictions, and S stands for the unique outcomes of measurements. I'll explain what these conditions are in more detail. Assuming those three conditions, which typically we do, in many environments, even in quantum information theory, when we describe protocols, we get a contradiction. What are these assumptions? So let's look a little bit more in detail into this. Assumption S says, when we do a measurement, we should get a unique and a single outcome. So quantum mechanics describes external systems from the perspective of an observer. And when the observer interacts with the system, the state collapses and I get a unique outcome. There is a cut, Heisenberg cut, which is assumed, and that could be relative. So there's a cut between observer and observed system, but it's relative and irrelevant. This means any system can be treated as an observer. Universal validity of quantum mechanics says that um, when I'm not, when an observer or is not interacting with a system, then it can describe the system as via the unitary evolution of quantum theory. You could even encapsulate S into a bigger super system and then trace out the part uh, so that you describe the subsystem. When you are interacting with it, when the observer O interacts with the system S, he can always adopt an external perspective so that every apparent collapse can also be treated as a unitary evolution, the dynamics to describe uh, the system. Now, assumption C says that, um, refers to the consistency between agents, it says that the descriptions obtained in this way between different observers have to be mutually consistent. So the observers can exchange their information and that should not lead to a contradiction. And even if they can't communicate, they can always reason from the perspective of the other observer. You can stand in the shoes of the other observer. You can reason counterfactually, encapsulate that information into your own information, and you would not get a contradiction. 
That's what assumption C says. In this explicit form, the FR paradox is a theorem. There is no arguing with it. You get a contradiction. Now, which assumption must we give up and why, right? So clearly something is wrong with these three principles. And how do you explain then the apparent validity of all these three assumptions in any standard context? Quantum information theory protocols, communication protocols typically involve multiple observers. And there we don't seem to assume any contradiction. Um, even when we look at science as a social activity, we have scientists communicating about their measurement outcomes or results or experiments. We don't apparently seem to assume any contradiction there. So I think uh, maybe I just don't get it uh, completely, but what, what's the reason why we must give up one of these three things? Because, because the paradox will show that they're um, so when measurement outcomes are supposed to be unique, when I do measurement, I get a unique outcome. And when I communicate my measurement outcome with somebody else, then we're supposed to give a unique state description to a physical system and not different state descriptions. It's not okay for me to say this is in pure so, state so A and the other is in says that together this postulates lead to a contradiction. And most people consider by just pure logic that contradictions cannot be true in reality. If you deny that, so given that, <laughs> we have to give up some one of the postulates. Uh, Unless yeah, you accept the reality, theory. Yeah, yeah, we get there. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, this is what the whole the talk is about. Like, why do we get a contradiction? How can we avoid it? Because that will mean that we solve the paradox. Okay. okay. So let's look at the most simple case. Wigner's friend thought experiment. So here I have two agents, uh, which I draw as smileys. Wigner, who I put outside of a lab. I have a lab L, which is this box. And inside the lab, I have the friend of Wigner, which I call F. Right? So the smileys are my agents. F inside the box, Wigner outside. There is one quantum system, system S. And now F inside the lab L can measure the system S, while Wigner outside can measure the entire lab. Can measure, he's considering this as an entire system uh, composed of S and F. Okay, let's put some notation there and this, I'll tell you which state these things are in. So I'm assuming it's common knowledge to all of them that my quantum system S is in a superposition state written in the zero one basis or the plus state. So it's superposition of zero plus one. So that's the initial state that my system S is in. Now I'm assuming that inside the lab, my F is going to measure S in standard basis, zero <laughs> one basis. He records an outcome, and the outcome can be either zero or can be one. Zero for when he measures the state to be zero, and one for when he measures the state to be one. Suppose the actual outcome is going to be zero. Does not matter what well, happens to be zero? Now, what happens to Wigner? Wigner is outside. He describes the entire lab as an experiment using the unitary evolution turing equation, right? So it uses the unitary transformation that actually entangles S with F. And he computes the result, and I call this state to be fail. So, so S and F are going to be correlated now, plus, uh, so we get zero, zero, zero for the state S of the system, zero for the state F in that case, plus one for the state S and one for the state F. So this is a big superposition state, and I call that the state fail. Okay, so why why do you call this fail? Because I, I well later on when we go to the FR paradox, they used exactly this this type of notation fail. Okay, yeah, so it's I, just a bad uh, state, but uh, it's just it's a bad state. A bad notation, but uh, it's, we 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 put it to be consistent with the future with the notation that they use in the FR paradox. Okay, okay. So the the dual state to the minus they call it okay because it plays an okay role there. And this is fair. Right? Okay, but, okay, okay. In quantum information theory, this is better zero zero. 
But why, uh, one of the bell states. Why would I expect the lab, like a microscopic object, to be uh, governed by unitary transformations and stuff like that? I mean, it's not isolated system. Either. That's one of the assumptions. Quantum theory should apply. No, these are just the assumption. This is important assumption. The lab is isolated. No one does anything with it. We consider it sealed. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, we apply, we, we look at the world from the perspective of double linear. He's the observer for his own, from his own perspective, and he applies quantum theory, which says every interaction that doesn't involve me, it's a unitary evolution. And he applies it in the view of this universality principle that says you apply to everything, including to microscopic objects, yeah. every system. But uh, but microscopical uh, there's also things like decoherence. Yeah. yeah, but that happens later. That can happen when it's not either. Of okay. course. So you're assuming that it's all you there. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I ask a yeah, so question about this? Because one I, would give. I think it's very a very important point. So F can be in any system, not it yes. can also be some F uh, can be a recording thing with a pointer that just points to zero one. Yeah, measurement, but it could also be a, a quantum system itself. Yeah. So you can have yeah. a quantum system quantum. interacting in the which case pretty clear, uh, clear that we can apply the inter right. Right. Then it's very clear, no? Yeah, in the case one, of the friend, maybe some people if you have a conscious uh, right. uh, person then it only becomes if you know. Then, uh, then and not assuming consciousness no, anywhere in the no, 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 but this is the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about friends is the worst. So yeah, so that's the thing. Like I would probably say that if, if F, F is a macroscopic object, it would not be in this bell state, but it would be in like a, a probabilistic superposition. So it's Are we getting there? Probability. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. But if the lab is isolated, fully isolated, yeah. for the time being, when W, when Wigner considers this problem, then uh, then it's a unitary evolution. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's what quantum theory tells. The, the coherence it essentially involves uh, labs that are not isolated. Essentially, they are entangled with the rest of the world, which practically happens all the time. But as long as you keep it isolated, it'll be a unitary evolution. It's like a system in itself. So Ritter is not interacting in any way with L at this moment, right? Yeah, so yeah, the coherence yeah. comes in from I'm sorry. Yeah. when there is some interaction. But right now, he just describes what happens to L. He yeah. knows that there is a measurement inside, so he describes it in this way, which is what quantum theory Yeah, but the whole thing is in the word, the use of the word friend. And so, I mean, <laughs> the problem with friend is that it's, there's a connotation of a conscious observer. And of course, this is not necessarily the case. It can be anything. Well, that's of course what Wigner himself of had course, in mind, obviously, yes. but yeah. abstract. So Wigner's solution to this paradox that she didn't think she presented, is that we shouldn't apply quantum theory to friends, to no, conscious yeah. beings, that conscious beings be behave for yeah. consciousness. Okay, not everybody in the world agrees with that solution. Oh, okay, this is the <laughs> whole, that's the whole debate, no? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it's very, uh, okay. But we are really assuming that these can be quantum systems, and so Hans, in that case, you can just describe the same. Okay, so now, this means that if you look at the system S, so then, what state do these different agents assign to the system S? So we saw that F inside the lab assigns to S the state zero. Measured it, got a zero outcome, so S must be in the state zero. W actually to S itself, he describes the whole lab as unitary, but S inside, he does a partial trace, he traces out the friend to S, he assigns a mixed state. He says zero with a half to S and one with a half to S, right? So these lead to different predictions. F predicts that any new measurement of S on the standard basis will yield uh, zero with probability one. W assigns equal probabilities, half half to zero and one. The question is who's right? In this so it's why the concept of being in a my quantum mechanics is a long time ago, but the system is in a superposition state between zero and one. And then every time. Well, the lab, again, the lab, big lab, is the ori original system before any measurement is done is in the plus state. So you assume that after the first measurement by F, the system 
S remains in the zero state and it doesn't go back to the 50 50. From F's perspective, yes. Yeah. Once he's done that, the system, according to F, has collapsed and is zero. He has measured zero, so he is not zero. But you would, I mean, maybe then I'm making things already too complicated. But you would expect that if you would measure, let's say, five minutes later, then it's already back into the. Not necessarily, no. If he measures again in zero one, this is now in an idle state and he just gets the ah. same result. Yeah. If F keeps but, measuring, but if, nothing happens, if nothing happens to the yeah. system, he but here we're not even talking about five minutes later. If you are talking at the same time, assuming there is a common time, the description of W of the lab and the description of the friend at the same time. The friend sees the zero, uh, the W sees a full superposition of the or entanglement of the whole lab. By quantum mechanics, he takes the trace, tracing out the friend, and he sees well, what he gets is. As you can see on each state, it says like, well, either it's a zero or a one or half up, right? Yeah, yes. but I mean, for me, this sounds also a bit strange because I think you, you don't you miss out a, uh, uh, well, one of the, of, of the possibilities. Uh, so the, the, the possibility that F assigns S uh, a one state rather than a zero state. So you assume here that F assigns S to the pure state, but you ignore all the uh, instances where it actually was the other. Well, the same reasoning would hold in case he would have measured one. If the whole thing collapsed to one. Yeah, but if you would, would do this, indeed, so maybe that's if you do an ensemble. Ah, okay, but that's a different. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, but it's correct. Yeah, but it's correct. Well, the ensemble, we see it's from the outside. It is definitely Dina's perspective. Right. Like you see that that what he does there is mid state is described as some. So this is indeed the perspective from the outside. If right. you don't, if you know just the collapse and you don't know how, that's what you would take. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, we cannot assign this to the friend because friend saw it, he sees ah, that. Okay. Okay. So from his perspective, it must be zero or right. maybe one, but right. let's assume it's zero, it's one of them. Right? Okay, now right. Okay. 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 Okay, so what do people in the literature say? Many authors. Rupner, quantum Bayesianists, um, Carlo Rovelli, they conclude that the facts, the solid state assignments to any system S, um, should be relative to the observed. And they represent this just, this should represent, so the state should represent the statistical summary of the past interactions between the system and the observed, given maybe together with some background information. So they say F and W, the friend and Wigner, they have different information about S. And so maybe it's natural that they assign different state descriptions to the system S that make different predictions. Our question is maybe so, but who is right? One must be right and the other wrong because quantum mechanics doesn't allow us different state descriptions to the same system. Now, um, Rupner goes even further and says, well, this points mainly that the objective facts, objective reality doesn't exist. Everything is deemed to be subjective and nobody is right. Quantum Bayesianists would say, well, the state description or the state of psi or the system just represents the beliefs of an agent and beliefs, of course, can be wrong. They can contradict each other. So that's fine. But we would say, well, beliefs should still also be right. They could be right. So is any of that right? Who, which observer is right? What does Hovelli say? He says that, well, the state design assignments do express objective facts. So that's different from Bruckner. But they are facts that are relational. So they're always relative to a system of reference, like in relativity theory. So there are many solutions in the literature. Um, now let's go back to the problem and see if under which cases uh, the two observers' predictions could actually be compatible with each other. Maybe they're different, but they could be compatible. So let's look at what they predict about the measurement of the state S of the system. So the state descriptions of F and W about S now, not about the lab, about the system S are compatible because one actually is a refinement of the description of the other one. One gets this mixed state, half, half, a zero, zero versus one, one, of half, half, zero versus one. And the other gets a, a, 
uh, probability one to the state zero that he saw. And one can be obtained um, uh, from the other one using standard Bayesian conditioning. So maybe we can interpret it as saying that the friend inside has just more information than Wigner outside, and his description is more informative than that of Wigner's. So does that mean that F is right? Now, you could ask, what if W measures the state of S now, if he actually does a measurement, right? Will he get the state zero with drawability one? There is a solution in the literature of Valley actually added a condition to his, um, uh, his theory. And that's uh, an extra postulate that he added, which says cross perspective links, where he actually wants the result of that question to be yes. So if you accept this, then indeed you could just say that Wigner outside just has less information, more uncertainty than the friend inside. But in principle, the states are compatible because you can get from one state to another one using Bayesian conditioning. But that's when we look at a system S. Now let's look at the lab, the, the, the state assignment to the whole lab L. Things get weirder when we focus on the whole lab. First of all, what would be the state that the friend inside the lab assigns to the lab? Now he is a, he's part of the lab. So quantum mechanics doesn't offer us a way for F inside the lab to represent the measurement of the lab himself, of which he's part. Quantum mechanics says that cannot be done. But of course, he can just reason from the mind or the point of view of an external agent. He could say, well, what state would Wigner actually assign to the lab if I take my information into account, namely that I saw zero? And then F would say, well, in that case, Wigner would tell me that the state isn't zero, zero. He would take into account the fact that I saw zero. So then the state of the lab should be zero for the system and zero for me. So, okay, so we assign to the lab, according to F, zero, zero, right? Taking the friend's information into account. Now, what is the state of the lab that Wigner assigns? Well, Wigner assigns this big superposition state fail to the lab L because actually no communication has happened. There's no communication that took place. The friend was just reasoning counterfactually about what state Wigner would assign. So no communication happens. So um, Wigner assigns to the lab the state fail. F assigns zero, zero to the lab. Both are pure states and they are incompatible. So there is no common refinement here. You cannot do Bayesian conditioning to say that they one can be obtained from the other one. So here you get radically different predictions concerning the outcomes of the measurements of F. Great question. Uh, so in this counterfactual history, I mean, even though it doesn't actually happen, this counterfactual, but um, is the assumption that there is a classical communication channel or a quantum communication channel in the counterfactual history? Classical. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, I don't think it makes a huge difference here, but I mean, it's, it's assumed in all these paradox scenarios to be a classical communication. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I don't understand this last reason that they are incompatible. So because previously it was a superposition of both outcomes. Yeah, that's not the case. suddenly it's not anymore. No, no. Yeah, w was science, a big superposition yeah. fail. But if it's a superposition and yes. still be uh, the, the, the first answer, zero, uh, zero, zero, S, zero, F could still be. No, outcome. remember that there's a distinction between mixed state and superposition. Uh, Right? When we looked only at the cat at the S, then the assignments were a mixed state, half probability zero, half probability one, but this means the system is either zero or one. But we don't know. And the friend says zero. Great. Uh, zero probability one is more refined, more informative than half half. Now superposition is different. When we look at the full lab, we don't get a mixed state. We get a pure state, that's essential, which is this one square root of two, zero, zero, mm -hmm. plus one, one. For the whole lab, right? Versus zero zero. Again, for the lab. 
Now, these are two different pure states. That's what it, so essentially it doesn't mean with a probability is zero, zero, with a probability one, one. It means I know for sure, me, uh, we, not, that the C standard lab is in this particular state. Yeah, this predicts some, some measurements. Like if I would do a measurement in the standard basis, then with half probability, I will get that. With half probability, I will get this. Mm -hmm. But I don't do any measurement for that, right? But yet, right? So, but the problem is these two, depending on what you measure, may lead to different predictions because uh, probably in the next slide. Yeah, this is the measurement. So. And the thing is that's confusing, at least to me, then, is that so this whole question of you know, which, which state you're in really resolves about which information do you have as yes. if f has different information than right. w yeah and so given the fact that we know that they have different information doesn't that immediately resolve the paradox well that's what cubists say but yeah. on the other hand they have a problem because uh, the word information suggests that it must be true right what is a false information I mean, right so it's like knowledge and they can't be both true because quantum mechanics, they are incompatible. They really, they really lead to different predictions as, as this slide. Uh, yeah, well, what you say, would it be? So yeah. this means- But they uh, lead to different results. I mean, the moment that uh, we can actually start to measure something about- Yeah, let's and, do that. So that, let's, let's do okay, yeah, let's, yeah. let's do the measurement. So now, um, so we're in this situation here. So this is fail, so-called, yeah. and there is a dual state, which minus, which is called okay. So this is Wigner says this is the state of the lab, and uh, friend says this is the state. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. That's okay. Good. So now F state assignment is zero zero, which is that one, and so he predicts uh, when he does a measurement in the standard basis that he will get zero zero with probability one. Right. Yeah. So while well, a measurement in the orthogonal basis, he can choose, choose this at the basis in which he can measure. He can yeah. rotate and choose this as the basis. If he measures this zero zero, the state that uh, the system is in in this basis, he will get uh, outcome both outcomes with equal probability. Probability half for fair, half probability for okay. Wigner describes the system to be in fail, and so he makes total opposite predictions. He gives equal probabilities to the two outcomes in the basis 0, 0, 1, 1. He gives probability 1 to fail when he measures in the basis fail. Okay, right? So you get total opposite uh, contradictions. So what you could say here, uh, opposite results, uh, maybe F has more information about W when we do measurements of L in the standard basis, the zero one basis, or uh, you could say W, Wigner, has more information about measurements when he measures in the orthogonal basis. Yeah, so if I may, so this is the key, key point here that when we focus only on this S, we could get away by interpreting uh, in this difference in assignments as. As a difference of information, as in F is the inside that has more information. So, because we could, right? Now, when we look at the whole lab, uh, we get these things. So, depending on which basis we will do the measurement, right? Well, we can consider both, right? Well, we could try, we could change, choose which one to. Do. But if we go in towards one, then we see in that, yeah, the standard base, it seems by the same interpretation that F has more information. So, he's the one that predicts right. Actually, a very uh, postulate would imply that indeed with probability one, as before, as in the previous case, if we do the standard base, we will get exactly what the L says, zero is clear. But the same thing from the other perspective, if we do the measurement in the in the bell basis, in this sorry, in this <laughs> then because of bigger state, <laughs> with probability one, we'll get that this. Now, there is no quantum state, mixed or pure, or any, any theory that says there is a system which would, when you do a measurement in a standard base, probability one gets this. And when you do it in a standard base, probability one gets that. There is no such thing. Yeah. So this is incompatible. So this is actually the same argument as, as the Bell experiment. I mean, this is what you, what you call the Bell based, because it is kind of 
it's more basic. It's you know very simple. Well, well, it's about yeah, yeah but it's really yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, so Bell's point is to eliminate certain hidden variables. Right? So here, well, here it's kind of it's it's really about the difference of these two perspectives. Like right? yeah. who is right? I see the, I see the and at this stage, we have a problem. I mean, I, I still worry about this communication uh, channel. So whether it's classified or quantum, because if it's quantum, then then either they will have to share a basis beforehand to uh, to say in which basis they are going to measure, and then and then they are entangled already. Or if it's classical, then uh, then there is a, a question about how realistic it is, because if it's a macro, I mean. If, if it's a microscopic system that is measuring the the system, then it cannot have a classical channel. So, so the, if there is a classical communication channel, then it's not clear how this is compatible. No, I or how agree it... that right now you see there is no communication. So the problem is it's more of counterfactual. But indeed, uh, people look at what happens when we do communication, and yeah. some yeah. people argue that then the paradox is solved by communication, although it's not classical. <laughs> by the way. Because okay, so it's purely the two two agents. Because the only way to solve it is to assume that communication changes the state. That is necessary. Right? There is a version of the paradox with <clears throat> explicit communication. So we'll. But we'll what, what does it mean for F to to make this counterfactual? Well, let's not even talk about F. How about so? Okay, this counterfactual yeah. point. Well, so the first the first thing that people say is I'm a bit. Late because Rouge forgot to tell us when it's half past. So, um, uh, so um, yeah, I may take extra yeah. 10 minutes or so because, um, all right. So, then, all right, what you're saying in a way agrees with what people did kind of uh, uh, the first lesson they tried to get is look, look, so this kind of reasoning about other agents putting myself out of in these other shoes, either Wigner for the friend or friend for the for Wigner, and what if. Uh, the other one will have my information together with this. Uh, it's responsible for the contradiction. So essentially, this is programmatic. They say we shouldn't do that, right? So in quantum mechanics, maybe we should never do that. We should try to stick with the with the with the points of view as they are. That's what Robert says. Stick like the reality is always situated. You always consider systems from one perspective at a given time and stick with it. Right? There is no reason to, to try to um, to, to unify them. And they also try to show that if they actually communicate, like we're saying, then there will be no contact. Like when they, one, one sends the results, the measurements to the results to the other, then they they get consensus again, as we'll see um, in a second. All right. So, as long as that, so yeah, this means we can allow contradictions, so to speak, as long as they are between different perspectives. Then we explain them somehow, as I said, QB statements say these are just different views. And they are in fact the beams. Okay. Uh, but the contention is not centralized in any one agent at any moment. All right. Sorry, maybe let's I put it a bit last sentence. So, so the the so essentially uh the idea is that some people say that we we don't have a view from an, a view from nowhere like the Robert, you know? mm -hmm. uh, but then this which means essentially this global inconsistency between different perspectives is not a problem as long as we don't get the contradiction or the only information in one place this contradictory information uh, then is no problem I mean, you will never encounter. It. And by the time it gets to one place, it's actually the change, the states change because it's communication actually. So then maybe there is no problem from this relational or subjective perspective. Now we can restate the paradox in, in for Neumann's term in terms of this cut. Remember, the cut is arbitrary. So me, the observer, me, I can choose to do the cut in one way or in a different way. As long as I'm part of the observer, so I am the observer. Uh, I could be the only observer, or I can include other parts of the system. I can extend my cut to include other others as joint observers, like you know, observers as me. Um, which, by the way, people do all the time. 
if you look at in any quantum information book and you look at the teleportation quantum field, any possible, it involves typically multiple agents. And the way to reason, Alice about Boven, is that when the protocol says, even if Alice is very far away, she does a measurement, well, because they know the time, eh? the bot knows the protocol is being obeyed, so he knows she did a measurement. So he doesn't use unitary transformation, doesn't intend to Alice. And it's not because of the coherence or anything, but because he knows that. So he's, he assumes the collapse. So he assumes the moment and another observer interacts with the, uh, with the, um, with the system, it also collapses. Uh, except I don't know the result, of course. So I have to consider a mixed state. This is a but this is a mixed state. It's not a yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So then, so this means now we can talk about a kind of two perspectives in the mind of the same age. Let's say double. He can adopt the minimal time. The minimal time says, I am the only collapsing observer in the universe. I consider everything else to be when they don't interact with me, a unitary evolution. Then he will have to assign to the to the lab this fair uh, L, this pure state. But he can also adopt the extended cut, which says, I am a collapsing observer, but my friend also is. Right? So whenever he interacts with a, with a system, the system collapses, so they cannot be entangled like that. Uh, and then, well, I just don't know the result of these measurements. And because of the previous superposition, which was one square root of two, uh, I will assign to the lab this um, essentially uh, this mixed state, right? Zero, zero. So the lab is zero. It's not. It's not fair. You see, it's not. It's actually a mixed state. Zero, zero, probably half, and zero, zero, one, one, uh, half. All right. The problem is, of course, now we have a contradiction not between Wigner and his friend, but, but between Wigner and Wigner. <laughs> Wigner using the minimal cut. And we, we in a sort of existing, sort of existing mood in which I don't observe the universe. And we are using a very common thing in all quantum protocols that involve multiple agents, namely the extended card that says well, they are also observers. And again, these two states will predict different things about measurements, right? Sorry, I mean, I, in, I, I don't know where to understand the word extended cut. It seems like a smaller cut, and you close it. It seems closer to the S, it's between S and F. The okay. extended cut is a smaller cut, it's almost like a restricted. Okay, I, this is just a moment. Well, well so it depends on where you look from. from where you look from. I'm okay. looking for the result of V, right? Ah. So it says like, ah, I now I, I push the observe system further, and I include my friend among the observers. Yeah, but then you actually go to the, the classical system nation. So you Well, I consider, if you like, it's the same as considering the right. friend as a classical slide, okay? Yeah. But we all do that. So then essentially because at least without friends, huh? So um so then it's yeah. and then the contradiction is here, and like it seems odd that we can reason from the, to this uh, different perspective for this from the same agent, and that, they, that according to the to the to the wisdom, common wisdom that comes from Heisel and von Neumann, this choice of cut should be arbitrary, should not matter, but it does. It seems to do in this case because they really give different predictions and prediction probably one of these opposite things. So, yeah. all right. So, what to do? Maybe you should always observers should stick with only one perspective, one fixed cut, never extending it. By the way, when when Rovelli and others um, work in this relation of quantum mechanics, they 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 consider that always the state of a system relative to an observer, but that's not telling you much. They also implicitly consider the minimal cut always, which means from that perspective of that observer, he always considers himself as the only observer, right? Rather than this, right? So the other perspective simply doesn't exist for them, so to speak. Um, all right, but this sounds rather sarcastic, and as I said, it's it's the cause opposite to what we do in presentation of standard quantum protocols and on the way people reason and also the way it's formalized when people reason about other minds or other northern what we, what the other knows uh, the so-called theory of the mind that we are testing even in animals and for which what we do multi-agent systemic logic what logicians do was to formalize besides that kind of reason you will see some things like how do i know that you know or I can reason about what you could know and this whole thing assumes that I can, I can move the cut, right? I can counterfactually think 
from your perspective, at least, and even put it together what I think you might know, you could know with what I know, and have a coherence between them. And we don't. Um, all right. Now, what if we start to do communication, right? Or measurement results by the other agent? So now, actual communication. So what happens if F communicates in measurement results to W? Then the two perspectives do get unified again, right? Um, they both will assign 0, 0 to the W. But the explanations are different. Maybe it doesn't matter. But the two perspectives give you different explanations. Either the two perspectives of F and W, or if you like, from W's perspective, but when he has two, two different cards, minimal card versus the other, one, which he considers his friend as an example. According to the minimal cut, the state of the lab was a pure entangled state, fair, until Wigner gets the, communica the, 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 the communicated results. Right? So the lab is like that. If you like, you can even imagine the signal coming to Wigner, and, you, and there is a big entanglement between the lab and, lab and the signal because you don't know what's there. And only when the signal comes to Wigner and Wigner reads it, that's when the collapse happens. So then it's actually the other part disappears and you get to zero zero. Right, so that's how we get there. At the intermediate step, in between, before the signal, after the measurement was done by the friend, and before the signal was read by Lina, the state is still there. According to the extended cut, or if you like, to the first perspective, the state of the line was already zero zero from the moment the, the, the friend saw it. Already that state. Uh, and the communication is a classical communication because it's just a simple case of copying. We are already in an argument, so there is no change of state of the lab because of the communication. It's just Wigner gets it, right? The zero zero. Right? So it's a different explanation. And even if in the end the perspectives are unified in the outcome, the intermediate stuff just before the signal was read, read by Wigner, it's still a contradiction. <laughs> that's it's the description that don't match. So it seems that. It's a happy ending at the end of the scenario if we do communication that the objectivity or this consensus between the is regained, but they disagree at the intermediate times somehow and on the explanations. Now, okay, um, Deutsch 1985, he tries a clever trick to, uh, to, make this, to make the contradiction more obvious and then he tries his own solution by changing the communication in the following thing. So um, F doesn't tell to, uh, to W what he saw. He only says, I saw something, a definite result. It's zero, or maybe I saw one, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> I, I think this is cheating because in a way it does not. It's like, Wigner should already know that, right? But okay, this kind of intuitively forces Wigner to, to adopt the extended cut. To say, aha, so he collapsed the measurement because he says he saw something, a definite outcome, zero. So then, well, maybe he saw zero, and then the lab is zero, zero. Maybe he saw one, 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 one. And since he didn't tell me, my properties come from what I knew before, come from. <laughs> but of course, this is incompatible with the other reasoning, also by Wigner, which she said, no, 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 whatever he tells me, I already knew all that. <laughs> He's entangled. He's this dead. <laughs> like it's a, I, as long as I don't know the result, it, I do a minimal cut. I'm the only collapsing agent in any case. Collapses happens when I see it, and I didn't see anything. This this disjunction doesn't tell me anything. Like I measure it, I obtain something. All right. Now this FR part of the Sonia mentioned, of which yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm somewhat really clear on why this forces him to. Yeah. To be on one state or another. Uh, just as I, I don't think it works at all, but it appears so, right? Kind of suggests um, uh, suggest the collapse, suggests that Wigner should consider the collapse already happened, right? Okay. But of course, I mean, yeah, you said that there was no information in this sense. And so, in the... yeah, according to me, there is none, but not according to Deutsch. Wow. Okay. Or Bruckner also puts, um, okay. gives a different version of the same thing. Not according to Deutsch. So it's like he says, no, now, now we should not. According to me, well, well, if you adopt and you stick with the minimum cut, then this, this sentence doesn't tell you anything, right? Because it just says the friend is correlated somehow, but I know it's correlated because look, 
this much stay, brand is correlated. So that's what I know. If you adopt the maximum, the extended cut also doesn't tell you anything because then, then I have a mixed state of already. Yeah, I, be, I believe that he collapsed already state because he's an observing agent like me. And the measurement doesn't, the announcement doesn't tell me anything in either case, right? According to him. So but it's like he, you can as well not communicate. Um, well, but it tells me something in the sense that. But in part, either, it depends on whether you're not in the tail state or in the the zero zero one one state. I mean, no, no, no. But this is the, the, we assume the protocol says the friend measured the, the state as the system yes. in the standard state, right? Yeah. The standard base, and they also agreed what was, they communicated prior to the experiments, and they coordinated the the, the, the base in the other state. That's okay. So they know what's going on. Okay. All right. Um, now, this more recent FR paradox, which probably I'll not have time to explain in detail, in a way, you see the more subtle version of the same thing. Um, it allows for a limited form of communication. Now, there are four agents, two dinners, and two friends, and two boxes, two labs. Uh, dinners are outside, the friends are inside, and they observe something. And there's a little bit of leaking from one lab to the other. Uh, and the limited form of communication because the other, uh, but um, it's not much, it's not enough to give out away the results. But in such a way that, in a way, suggests or makes people think, oh, we should allow the friends inside to be observers like me, like the leader. Right? So we should have an extended time. And then um, that's incompatible with the meaning. That's what I, I claim. And the paradox uh, follows from that. So this is the scenario. There are two beginners W bar and W. There are two friends F and F bar in two labs, L and L bar. Um, the system is here, S, the original system with F. It's as before, it's in a superposition of zero, from zero and one plus, uh, right? So half up. It's a superposition. It just starts with the coin, R. R is it? I know, yeah, right. R Maybe is the I... first system that's <laughs> being measured. Yeah, so R, it's actually called a coin there. Quantum coin, and yeah, it starts the... up. Yeah. And then uh, F bar measures the uh, system R in some base. We don't care. Let's not care about details because I don't have time to do the computations. Uh, and now, depending on the outcome that he gets, uh, he, he prepares a system S, which is essentially a signal that he sends to the other lab. So there is communication of this kind in the lab. And the sigma, signal, <laughs> you see, depending on the measurement, either matches what he sees like zero, let's say. So essentially communicates at the zero there. Or in the other case, communicates a plus state, a superposition. So essentially hides in one branch the information that it has in the superposition, and the other one uh, allows it exactly copied. That's the signal, that's the protocol. All right, so that goes from up to down. After that, uh, the, the other friend, measures the signal, right, to get uh, an outcome. First, W bar measures? Yeah, yeah, that's with the uh, No, then W bar, after that, measures the first lab, or the whole, like in the Venus thing. But now he actually measures, measures right, the lab. Why I say he actually does, because it's not a counter factor. He actually does that, which, think about it, we we'll entangle the F bar and R. So if we first assume there was a collapse there, now, the, now it's undone. That collapse is undone. That will become a big superposition because he measures it in, in this orthogonal way. It's fairly okay. Mm -hmm. Right? So even if we assume if we assume that there was superposition, then there was a, a, a collapse, then after that is not, it's back back into entanglement, right? Because he measures it in this orthogonal base. All right. And then fourth, W does the same on the other lab. Measures it in orthogonal base, essentially, uh, fail or okay. Now, the, they put in terms of a halting con condition uh, because they imagine this protocol repeated many times. I, I don't have to put it like that. Essentially, the following, the reason is the following. We can adopt the minimal cut. Let's look from the other side. The minimal cut, well, in the, in the case that WW bar, there shouldn't be any problem because they don't measure each other. There's, uh, they they co classically communicate, or if at all. So we can consider them to be observers. 
So we can uh, either say they are both observable, but the, but the systems in the lab are quantum. So we do unitary evolutions and we reason in this way till the end. Uh, or we can do the very extended cut in which all four of them are collapsing observers. So then at each moment of the protocol, the state collapsed according to the measurements, even if the others don't know how. Right? And then we compute what happens. And in this minimal or external computation, from this perspective, in which all this is big, gets a big entanglement. Yeah, just one more it, quick question. So yeah. you said R actually uh, is influencing S. So what yeah. is this? Uh, how, how no, it's no. So the the F bar measures are right. in some base, depending on the outcome. Uh, he sends then a signal here. Right. This is S is the result of the signal. And the signal is given to, to appear to leak some information because in one of the cases, because there are two outcomes, in one of the cases, he just sends that outcome like zero. In the other case, he, super, he sends a superposition. So, right? Uh, all right. Now, the, um, okay, if we reason from the external perspective, the mean, what I call a minimum cut, then we, we compute the whole thing, like the, the big, big, uh, big superposition in the first moves. And then we do a measurement of this by this and of that by that, those collapse. And what we get is that it's quite possible uh, for all four all comes fail, fail bar here and well, fail bar, okay, bar and okay, and okay, and yeah, and fail to be obtained. And in particular, okay and okay bar, which are the view of this with minus, are obtainable with probability one over 12. Happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I'm sorry, I really don't have time much. So you could read the paper to see the com uh, computations. Okay, good. So since one of the 12 is not zero, this can happen. The way they put it, you repeat it until it happens. I don't have to repeat it, just suppose it happened because for one of the talks means occasionally it happened. So let's suppose in this case, it happened. W bar got okay bar, W got okay, right? Then we reason backwards, assuming this time extended cut, which means the states already collapse when F bar measure them and that one when F bar measure. But then you see, that uh, some branch of this collapse is incompatible with getting okay bar. It never happens, it's orthogonal to it. So this means if this, we know that this is okay bar now, we deduce that th that branch never happened. That you actually can deduce the, what outcome was there, right? And actually join because the outcomes are correlated by the signal, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, uh, in that, so now we eliminate one branch of this collapsing, we get only the other one as possible because we know okay, but, but the other branch is impossible, is it makes okay impossible because it's orthogonal to okay. So both of them are orthogonal to one part of that, which means according to this reasoning, okay, okay, bar never happens, right? Okay, okay, bar never happens. So not to throw it in one over 12, it never happens. So if you see it happening ever, and the W and W bar are allowed to communicate to each other. Yeah, so then they know it happens because look, but then by the extended perspective that involves collapse by the friends, it shouldn't happen. It cannot happen. If I got okay bar, you got fair. So this dramatizes because it's something that we imagine, of course, <laughs> imagine can, you can do it. Right, so I repeat it until it happens because one over 12, and then you know, oh, I obtain a contradiction. Of course, this again assumes as before that you can isolate these friends inside the box and keep them from decoherence, right? <laughs> but, um, are the people doing actual the actual experiment? Yeah, well, they did, but of course, you replace the friend by microscope, microscope yeah, feature. Yeah, and no, and the friends are quantum. Yeah, and then and then guess what? It's one over twelve. It does happen. Okay, okay, but right, it does happen. Okay. Now uh, you can explain this by saying, saying, well, but these microscopic friends are not friends. And if friends are microscopic, can they do their experiments? No, because they, the technology did not succeed to entangle microscopic objects to a 
enough degree that you can actually measure, like, have them under full control in this specific space. Of course, they can be integral, but I mean, the integralism, I don't know, it's probably, it was essentially legal, yes. So then, right? So, yeah, whenever you can do it, actually, the one over 12 is two. So, okay, okay, but it does happen. But it seems to be incompatible with be, being allowed to reason, even from example, uh, about your friends as being friends, as being collapsing agents, collapsing observers. So that's the paradox. Well, isn't that the conclusion that there are no collapsing observers? Yeah, sorry? Isn't then that the conclusion that this quantum? Well, that's our conclusion. conclusion. That's part of our solution. But you, have, you need a principal reason why, yeah. of course. And many people, I mean, people disagree on that. Um, on what is the correct reason? <laughs> Um, okay, this is the timeline. Let me see. Why? All right, so it's clear there is a contradiction. Now, people put it in terms of um, knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer is a principle that follows from, so as I said, people do epistemic logic. They use this knowledge about knowledge and they try to reason. There are some postulates. And knowledge pass transfer is something that follows actually the standard epistemic logic from this postulate. You can also consider it by itself. By itself, it says the following. If I know that you know something, then I know that. So it allows me to transfer the knowledge from one to the other. And the problem is, when I, in order to even write this according to me, for O to know that O prime knows something, then O has to consider O prime as an observer, as a collapsing agent, <laughs> which means he has to adopt that extended cut, right? Right. So then, if you do that in the Wiener or in the FR paradox, then you get the wrong conclusion. You get the, the, okay, okay, but never happens because you know that they see this or that, and you reason using putting it. Yeah, so you, you then you know that yeah, since you know that they know one of this, then you know it too. You put it together with the information and you deduce in the end that okay, okay, but cannot happen because they collapse. Right. So. Right, so there's no knowledge transfer. And they, they blame, these people blame the paradox on this principle. They say, shouldn't be true. Because <laughs> uh, this principle follows from some ba basic principle, namely factivity, which says, well, knowledge is true. <laughs> if I know, or anybody knows something, then it's the case. So that's a problem uh, that's for the people who use the word knowledge, right, or information. It's not a problem for cubicians, for cubists, because they think it's all beings. I mean, there is no, I mean, reality is not knowable by quantum theory. All the quantum theory is about beliefs. Well, rational beliefs uh, given some information, and that's all. As I, there is no need to agree or to be true. And then it follows together with this monotonous principle, which essentially it's also you know, trivially and intuitively clear. Um, all right. Uh, Healy does for FR what we did, what Sonia did here for, uh, I don't know if you remember. For the Wigner, then we tries to internalize so that to make that there is no need for communication, there is not really need to reason about reason to knowledge about knowledge. It's you only need to right. So W and W bar only have to assume collapse by the others, but they don't have to do the to assume that those are reasoning agents that know anything, but they just assume that those are collapsing agents that you know measured something, right? Like a measurement apparatus, you can assume that it measured something, right? Maybe. That is, a, that is a definite sign in it, zero or one, but you don't need to assume that he knows or he can reason about others. And still the contradiction works because that's, that's the problem. Uh, I'll skip this. And all right. So roughly because I'm over time, our solution is based on a particular uh, implementation of Robert's relation on quantum mechanics. And it's different from a very solution, recent solution in a recent paper. Um, so essentially, we start by saying yes, states, state assignments or state descriptions are always relative to some background uh, system of reference, which you can call the observer. Of course, also at the same time, every system, every system in the universe could be taken as an observer, as a system. You can change that, right? So in that sense. The cut is arbitrary. Uh, that's what Robert says. Um, uh, so we accept assumptions in, in this uh, assumptions that Sonia mentioned, S and Q. 
the, the cut is relative in a sense. Every system is an observer from its own perspective, can describe the rest as unitary transformations. While from a, an external perspective or another region, the same interactions that involve collapse by the original one can be described as unitary. Okay, so that seems already to be a contradiction, but um, now the C is the assumption that information can be shared, or if you like, that there has to be consistency between these different perspectives. And it seems that this okay, is a people the assumption C was, I mean, um, where S was state and quantum was unitary. But Quantum is essentially quantum universal. It says I can I can treat everything as a quantum. Right. Um, yeah. S is the one that says single outcome, so outcome which is know. like the, if you want to imagine something else, uh, it's the multiverse view that denies single outcomes. Says well, whatever the agent, the observers think they see, is just a little appearance. The real effect is the big superposition at the level of the universe. So there is measurements never produce single outcomes. This is just an effect, like a perspective, so to speak, which is like like a colors, like a negative phenomenon. There's not effect. The real effect is a big time at the level of the whole state of the universe. Period. So then you never have collapse to one one of the others. You can think of the grand branching universes or whatever, but you don't have the reality doesn't concentrate only on one outcome. And so this goes against S. It says measurements have single outcomes when they have. And Q is the universal. It says I can always yes, right. And see this that they say this uh, this should be somehow coherent with each other, compact object or pet, right? Or they put in terms of sharing, but I don't want to put in terms of sharing because I don't think it's necessary to share, you know, to talk about compatibility. Just you can do it in your mind, control con con touches. All right. So, in other words, um, this sharing or C essentially implies the problem. Not only every system is an observer from its own perspective, but every system as an observer has the option, valid option, to extend its cut to include other systems as potential observers and to consider them at any given moment. Okay? They can do it. And that it shouldn't matter. And I think the lesson of the paradox is that it does matter. When you put the cut, it does matter. You can't just do that. So on one hand, every system is an observer from its own perspective, but not every system should be admitted as an additional observer from the perspective of any other system. So it's like the coherence there, or the incoherence, suggests that systems cannot be always observer from the perspective of other systems. And then we need some conditions to, to, to ensure that. Why do we want some conditions? Well, because if this is the end, because <laughs> in a way, <laughs> then is the end of the talk, then we are get to a sort of existing view of the world in which you just have these joint perspectives and okay. Right? And in a way, quantum measurements is very close to that, essentially. Uh, and you never can justify, say, the use of uh, like this systemic cutting, for instance, teleportation or other quantum protocols in which people do that. Or the, the, the epistemic law, the multi-agent epistemic law, then it makes no sense. <laughs> okay? So uh, we want to say sometimes we can do that. And the whole paper is about in what conditions this is a valid, I mean, option. Like an agent can, can stick with minimal cut, but also can use the extended cut with respect to other systems considering what's collapsing. So in what conditions does this happen? And the main idea is the following observers are leaky systems. So only open systems can be regarded as observers. And this openness or leakiness is always from the perspective of the background observer. So it's relative to, 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 to what he observes. And also it's, it can be relative to a period of time or to a set of histories or a protocol or a scenario. Because it might be that nobody's really observer forever. That it, you may erase their memory <laughs> or, or do funny things to them. They die. Um, uh, collapsing in a, in a, in a Big Bang, uh, sorry, uh, the code. but I mean, the idea is that for if you have device to a certain perspective, a certain protocol, a set of history, and to a background observer, there are conditions to be sure that sometimes other systems can be considered as additional observers. And the main condition is essentially this, that during that period, and as far as the background observer can tell, essentially, as far as he knows, the information, carried by those other systems and the friend 
survives till the end of the protocol, somewhere. In other words, that is recorded somewhere in a safe or persistent record that is not destroyed at any moment of any history that forms part of the scenario. If that's the case, in this condition, it's essential that you can check it without assuming the threat to be a threat, yet, to be a observer. So you first treat everything from the position of minimal cut. I'm all, I treat the whole thing. Then I can uh, check. Okay, the rest is for my reason, right? I can check if this condition is true. This condition tells me that, in some sense, the information, even if it's a big entanglement, but still the information carried by uh, by the subsystem either survives as it is in that place in him in his memory till the end, or if the memory is destroyed, well, it's just in time before that it has been copied in a different place, record which is safe from destruction. And if that one is destroyed, it has been copied in a further place, right? So in that sense, observers are uh, systems are little that essentially, from the perspective of all, he, he cannot control so totally that, that, that subsystem to stop the information from, from totally leaking. Right? So we cannot be sure, even if it happens that he destroyed it all, but he doesn't know. He will never know during the protocol. As a result, he has to assume with some little probability that the leak has happened, that the record has been made of the results of the measurements, which has been put somewhere saying that he cannot touch it during the protocol. If that is the case, then F is declared to be an admissible observer from the perspective of O. And then, then only then, um, only then he can, uh, the O can adopt this extended card, can add F to his community of observers. Uh, because you can prove that in that case, the two perspectives uh, are compatible, the minimal cut and the other one. That's a, they will lead to the same prediction. That's the idea. To, to stress some last points, because already Zorush uh, <laughs> made some signs, um, the condition is less strong than it that seems to. It doesn't mean that observers are indestructible or their memory lasts forever. It's quite possible that to, to do these destructive measurements that we talked about, like W you know, destroys the lab or you know, entangles the lab, uh, as long as the information that originally carried survives by being copied somewhere else in the meantime. Right? So, <clears throat> And also this informational persistence, the fact that these records survive till the end of the protocol, the end of time, shouldn't be taken in absolute sense. They survive forever. Well, but this doesn't mean forever. It means early to a given period of the time, a given history or given protocol or scenario or set of history, right? So it's relative to that, the one under consideration. The, yeah, so you want not to reach a paradoxical connection for that. So maybe observers, or systems are, are, are potential observers from perspective of another one, only in a very relative sense. For a while, from the perspective of like given some big scenario, but maybe not forever in the capital level. Um, and as I mentioned, maybe, but I just want to stress, it's not even necessary to assume that the records will actually persist. It's just that as far as the O is concerned, the background observer, he cannot be sure that the records have been erased, that any trace of that information has been erased from him. He can never be sure during the protocol of that. So it's like possible, epistemic and possible, from my perspective, that uh, the friend leaked something. And as long as it's possible, with even a small probability, the paradox doesn't. And you can think of it as, like, in a way, giving some power to F, say, like, this guy can spread, disseminate, uh, or leak enough copies of. Of, of his information or story, etc. But also in a different sense, because of this epistemic aspect, it's like limiting the power of the background observer. It says like this guy cannot cannot really take his friends as treat them as his god and manipulate them to erase completely all their information. He's not never sure of his full control because something can be. Yeah, so even if they don't succeed to, to serve, make survival records, they might. And that's enough. And all right, so this is a principle of um, explanation that can, can apply to any system, microscopic or macroscopic. So it's just a condition that we formalize uh, using these notions of 
well, formalizing what is the scenario, what protocol is, and so on. What are these records exactly, and when are they are uh, uh, persistent? Um, now, although it doesn't have anything to do with itself, the macroscopic and microscopic distinction or conference, it does suggest, so it's, it kind of explains why this kind of standard epistemic reasoning, I know that you know, can be applied in common situations like a multi agent quantum protocols because macroscopic observers are typically weak due to decoherence, right? So they do get entangled before you even get to manipulate them. Typically, they can, they, they may at least, right? You don't have full control, they may get um, entangled with some part of the environment in an uncontrollable way. So that some information may leak and you don't know for sure, typically, right? So that makes them real observers in the sense, right? Admissible observers from my perspective of my kind, um, right? But they don't have to, it's not necessary that to do, this can happen not due to the coherence, but to other constraints, right? Of the, of the scenario, of the protocol. Um, so that's the idea. And then I skip the formalization also because it's not full anyway, but then uh, I have a position. Um, so essentially what's the conclusion, say on Rigna? Well, it, it depends, right? So the Rigna story is not finished. We are not told what happens after it or what can happen, right? We're not told the full problem. We have to specify what can happen. Like, can Rigna do this measurement immediately after that in the orthogonal basis of the lab or not? Can also Frank himself do the standard uh, have a choice in standard base and uh, orthogonal or not. Right? So once the protocol is fully specified all these histories, then there is a new conclusion concerning the map. So for instance, if no such measurement in the orthogonal basis is allowed, by the way, these are the measurements that in a way destroy the record, right? Because right, in, in the, uh, then uh, F, the friend is an admissible observer with respect to him. They are compatible with respect to all the predictions regarding measurements that can be done, but this one can't. Okay, if a destructive measurement in this orthogonal basis can be done, is allowed by the protocol, before any other record of the French information can be produced, before can, the French can communicate someone else with us, then F is not gonna be serious. And we shouldn't be, we should not be asked to reason from the other's perspective. It's just a quantum system from my perspective. Right? You're dead to me. Finally, if the destructive measurement of the lab in this autonomous race can happen, but only later, only after an interval of time in which, for all I know, I am being the friend may have leaked the information, may have made a copy somewhere else, uh, then that is again an observer, observer. So then I can extend my cut and say, yeah, welcome to the community of observers, the descriptions are compact. Right. Um, I, I give the example here. Uh, how about FR? FR paradox is actually uh, it's a good paper. You have to read because like the paradox is very fully specified. So there is not much of a choice. It doesn't matter what happens after because it's enough information there to conclude that by our by our definition, neither F nor F bar are admissible observers from the outside perspective of the They are. Uh, Although they may seem to leak information via the signal, that information is not a state, it's not a record in our sense because it doesn't preserve the information in all possible branches. So and you can see this even on the internet from our from a unitary perspective. So you can check, and then it, then this it says Wigner and Wigner bar should not be considered in F and F bar as, as, a, as an admissible observer. They cannot share this perspective, and that's the end. They're quantum systems for us. It's a case in which you cannot apply the standard reason in lack intelligent Simply that's it. Um, of course, if F and F are allowed to change the protocol so to make some sneaky uh, copy somewhere else and send it before the lab is measured, then they become this result. Okay, so that's the conclusions. And I'm sorry I'm over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah,
It's probably like it, I think it's very much related to, uh, to your definition to this paradox, but as a sort of a physician from a more physics perspective, so part of the physics of open quantum systems and things like Lindblad equation, right? So yeah. density matrix evolution. Like I think of quantum mechanics as density matrices instead of wave function. The density matrices. There are basically two things I can do to preserve the most generic density matrix in time evolution. One is unitary evolution. The other one is doing um, crowds operators, which is in effect sort of collapsing the wave function. Yeah. So so there's a, there's a unitary part and there's a non-unitary part, right? So the resolution to this paradox, if you're saying about the EP observer, is kind of, kind of saying, what is the, the thing that is implementing the measurement on the system? Is it the unitary part of the Lindblad equation that just rotates uh, mm -hmm. the thing into uh, another unitary state? Or, and then I have, let's say my, my, uh, my friend is a quantum system and Wigner has this field state and everything, you have the minimal club. And, uh, uh, or I can say that like my friend in the lab is uh, doing a Krauss operator, right? He's just really measuring. Is it in English? I, I don't know. I'm saying the right function. Is it in general quantum theory, like uh, so called? It's related to open quantum systems. Yeah, yeah, but that's a theory of essentially that says uh, we take systems as default. And there's a default rather than the. So then, right. the, the, then the the the, the, the uh, you, unitary evolution are not the whole story, right? And it's not because we don't know. Yeah. It's not the yeah. ignorance. Yeah. It's not statistical yeah. stuff. It's not the ensembles. It's because systems are open. <laughs> so then, an open system, I cannot describe it at any moment as just a unitary evolution. I have to discover the more general transformations. Right. And uh, the unitary is a special case for the very controlled system that can be uh, can be plot. Exactly. Uh, so yeah. So that's another way to do quantum mechanics, which is not a standard, but it's so I think we can formulate the solution maybe in a more elegant way, also in the, in the same way. But uh, right? explicitly using like yeah. these are the actual operators that essentially yeah. Yeah. yeah these are unitary transformations. Yeah, so rotate the thing and essentially this what happens is that we start with perspective, the minimal cut from the schedule of one of the answers, and he describes it like that. But when yeah. whenever I mean in order to, to adopt another one as, as an additional observer, he has to check that in fact. He's behaving like an open system, right? So it's not an unitary, but in a particular way that preserves information, right? Uh, so that, uh, right? So that, yeah. Um, you know, it is just unitary. But I, I agree mean, that that's a. Once you could your hand inspire the collapse. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is, so that might be a good way to to to, to, to write it out on this example with yeah. the state of that. This is kind of, for me, it's. Intuitive, right? Where at least if you're a Copenhagenist or like you live like in uh, in in sort of the, the wave function is a superstition physically and it collapses when you do the actual observe observation. Yeah. But then but yeah. But is there then still a paradox if you think that wave function collapses a physical thing? Yeah, well, it's the part. I mean, you can think of it as still a, a, some, some of the fundamental level of paradox in physics or whatever, but it's more of a fact that there are irreconcilable perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. But that for pragmatic and practical reasons, there are situations and there are well defined situations uh, which apply to all of all, most of, I mean, our life and microscopic in particular, in which this is not the case, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so we can have all these principles like uh, transfer of knowledge and uh, right and reasoning about others as uh, without any problem, right? But at the fundamental level, this will be different as uh, almost yeah you know, because yeah so this solipsistic stuff which is like yeah different perspectives we don't think. Um, Rovelli, by the way, is a different solution. Says like, look, there is always so we do the same. Right, a system has this, always a state with respect to an observer. And okay, you can consider maybe two observers, right? Um, and they are not the same, all right? But his solution is also used in uh, it's based on the coherence that says, aha, when the S itself, the observed system is macroscopic, it's very big, then the difference doesn't matter because uh, the interference effects are very small due to the So the result, uh, these are very close to each other. 
the, the differences. Yeah. So, right, but this assumes that this observed system, the cat, or whatever, it has to be microscopic for the green one to happen. In ours, it has to do with these two guys. When do they agree on any systems? Doesn't matter, even microscopic, right? Well, so there, when do they agree? And it tells you that when these two guys are decoherent, right? So they are probably microscopic or at least leaky, make copies, then their perspective are, are, are unifiable. You can explain the difference only by lack of information, mm -hmm. but uh, they, they can be they're compatible, not necessarily. Eh? So this is about these two guys being the bad observers or potential rather than the observers. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can follow. I mean, I have exactly a question about uh, the letter point about, so what exactly is the relation between this leakiness of uh, an information stored somewhere else and, and the decoherence picture? I mean, so is, is that very much related? I think it is, but I think the coherence is a specific mechanism that we ensure that with high probability this happens. Right, uh, but this can also happen because of the protocol. So you can have a fully controlled uh, protocol or experiment, including with microscopic stuff, no audience, but in which the protocol tells you that you know, according to these scenarios, they you know they follow the, they they're not allowed. They don't do uh, this kind of measurement before uh, the state of the it's copied in the sense of our end, which is just another entanglement. Right? So essentially it means the insider F, which could be a microscopic particle interacting with another one, uh, I can measure the lab in this orthogonal thing. I'm allowed to do it, this is a measure, only after uh, a certain further entanglement happens in which, in which that particle that recalls something uh, entangles with something else outside. Okay, then yeah. I can destroy the lab and I can, and I can still re recover this kind of, I can, I can think, I can, Meaningfully think about that little particle as, a, as an observer, a collapsing observer, because it doesn't make a difference. So okay. it can be due to the coherence, but it also can be to a, right? so to, to other okay. can, do that. can you also propose? I think that this was already mentioned by uh, by Val. Can you also propose an experiment to to uh, to, to see this change from uh, yeah, from the, the paradoxical situation to the non paradoxical situation? So where you uh, we yeah. can it's, see both. Uh, I, I don't know, it's already done, but it's just in a way it's mathematics. It's like the thing that the right, if we apply uh, quantum rules to the situation in which this uh, further entanglement happens, actually, I had some a bit of slides about that, but very sketchy, so I don't know if it's worth now going through. Uh, right, so in which rise I entangle two particles, uh, I can. I think of them as just a, a, a entangled system, quantum system, unitary motion. And I'm asking, hmm, maybe I could think of it as a, as a one of them observing each other, measurement, right? Some metaphorical. The problem is, if I allow this measurement next to happen, then uh, then this gives me trouble because I will get this kind of like essentially the reasoning based on allowing that microscope particle to be a, a collapsing agent is wrong. It's probably because. Because of FR, actually, things that shouldn't happen. Ever. Now, if, however, uh, I first entangle this one of the particles to some other thing that copies it, essentially right. correlates outside the lab, and, then, and only then I'm allowed to, to do this on the lab, then I, 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 then the both perspectives agree in the sense of like now I can consider the little particle as a, as a, as a collapsing. I can assume collapse right before I. Sorry, by the by the articles. So it's not a problem. Right? And that's what it means. That these are two are compact with this field. Right? And any protocol or any story, any scenario, we call it, uh, any set of histories which is systematic, like there are degrees of freedom that don't allow certain. So essentially, they have these persistent records that the information, the correlation, it's stored somewhere else before it's destroyed, or it's never destroyed, of course. But and then if that one, if that's somewhere else, it's stored, then it's stored somewhere else. So it's a copy. Any such things, you can consider the components whose information is not it's preserved to be collapsing and observers as well, because mathematics will tell you that in the end, the prediction is agreed. Right? That's the idea. So then, and that may apply to macroscopic objects because of the coherence, that's a possible explanation, or it may apply to consciousness or ignorance. That's another if that exists, probably not. But 
That's also another way to do, to implement this condition. What is consciousness? What is a soul? It's a way to store your information somewhere else that is not physical or it's, yeah, it's not touchable by my experiments in the quantum level. So if the guy has the consciousness that I can't touch, then it's stored there, right? So I don't know where is that. But that's possible. I mean, there are lots of possible universes here that are compatible with this condition. And then in that case, you'll say, aha, conscious agents are observers, collection observers, or I can treat them as such for practical purposes because this agrees with the, with the quantum theory. Right? There's another method. But any story that allows, I mean, to explain the measurement or the history in such a way that this, any story that breaks these conditions, which like this, uh, this information is erased before it's mm -hmm. somewhat stored somewhere else, uh, will essentially make these perspectives incompatible. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. Next. Um, yes, please. Um, okay, so in the beginning, you told us about the, the no go theorem, the three conditions. Are all interpretations of quantum mechanics, do they all violate one of these conditions? Where I think the FR paper reads goes over, uh, yeah, all the interpretations that I know are there. <laughs> so, yeah, so look, so of course, I'm not sure they give you anything exactly in those terms where they didn't, but after the paradox of the theorem appeared. Each partisan of each interpretation wrote his own paper, her own paper, in which claimed that this interpretation um, by, uh, does the paradox doesn't apply. We can solve it because of one condition test, right? Right. So, the, for instance, in the multiverse, in the Everett stuff, essentially S fails. I mean, there is no such thing as a single outcome of the question. All things happen. And that's the fact. That's a fact of nature. It's an objective fact. The rest is subjective. So, the WTB method is collapsing in whatever. It's, 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 it's not easy. So it's the same as putting your uh, cut outside yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, putting the cut on God, right? And not representing God because then you get in trouble. <laughs> no, no, I'm measuring that. Right, so then, yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, so. Uh, okay, but for instance, Copenhagen is a more old interpretation is to be the bad, right? So it depends on how you put it because, like, uh, which one hurts? Huh? I don't know. I don't think Copenhagen in the British originally even talked, like Sonia, but about different observers. You just like models everything from one perspective. Oh, and then you know where to do one when, when the evolution works. So there, there are some but people of papers where they treat what is an observer in each of the interpretations because that's crucial for this. Uh, so what is the notion of observer in all the kind of many worlds, uh, booming mechanics? Or, yeah. uh, I guess my next question is. Do, do we want this? Do we want all three of the conditions to apply? Because I guess all interpretations they violate one. Uh, is that a problem? Is that something we want? Or? I don't know. Like, uh, of course, probably you don't want if you buy the theorem and the steps are just computation, uh, unless somebody says, oh, something was not applied. You don't want. But then the question is a principal question, and really, which one falls, uh, fails and why? And in what sense, because you see, we also have a solution. Okay, this fell, but it's not about just failing. It's about how it fails, why it fails, and how can it appear to be true, actually? How can it happen that for pragmatic reasons, we can still reason about others as being collapsed, as observers like us, right? How, how is that possible? How, how can the theory of the mind? And or what are conditions for it? So that's like, not just failure, but also when it succeeds, when it succeeds. Yeah, and as a principle, not just like, okay, I hope, I made a change to my protocol and now no problem. But systematically, right? Like, yeah, I guess my question is do, do we want an interpretation that that works with all the three assumptions? Well, I think if you look at quantum information theory, there you have multiple observers, you have um start, you have collapses and new theories applied all over the case. Um measurements have single outcomes so yeah but one you value that very quantum universality fails because you treat these multiple observers as perhaps you observe all of them mm -hmm. instead of treating everybody as a also as a quantum system like as a new time you I don't have a thing right um uh, cool. or even do but only because those protocols don't don't allow you to do that right just do the reportation right uh Alice uh, entangles a uh, qubit with another, measures them in some basis uh, after some interest, and sends the signal to go. Ah, but before anything else, right, so while, while the signal is in the transit, 
all the system of qubits, the two qubits, Alice and the signal, are entangled from the Bose perspective. What if Bose can do one big unitary uh, transformation of that whole system to undo the whole thing to a little right? And now, now suddenly you see the predictions are different if you assume Alice is being a collapsing observer versus it's just a binary planetary hypothesis. They never, they never talk about the possibility. So it's as if not allowed in the world. Okay, so that's what we're saying. When it's not allowed, when it's somehow it's not possible, then either because of the coherence or because you, you don't do that, then it's okay. Right? If it's allowed, then it's a problem. Right? Unless Alice made another copy somewhere else that we can't start touch. So let's uh, finish by the there time time or well, three plus two. Okay. Uh, yeah, so going back to an earlier discussion, uh, the algebraic perspective uh so so there are these papers by uh by halverson and, and, and uh, Lifton, um which i mean it's long ago so i don't know exactly but what i recall is that they, they try to formalize the copenhagen interpretation and in particular what is an observer uh, as some something like if i remember correctly a maximal class of commuting observers something like that i don't know if you're familiar with this approach but um, if you could, if one could formalize what is an observer from the algebraic perspective by, for example, the class, the class of observables that are considered physical, mm -hmm. then maybe some of these epistemic questions could be translated into questions about what algebra, what, what is the algebra uh, mm -hmm. that is relevant. Um, and uh, have people tried that? Uh, I don't know the connection to the FR or linear paradox. I don't know. No, I don't. But it's consumer. I mean, if you have a notion of observing that somehow it's more sophisticated, not every system. So it's a limitation of the story of the like every subsystem is an observer mm -hmm. based on some other, some algebraic postulate or other constraints. Then you can try to apply to that to see what happens. Right? Is that, because, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, but I don't know. Okay, then I think we get the rest of the discussion over that and then thank you previously again. Agreement on the first question you'll ask would be what does this have to do with emergence? They <laughs> <laughs> don't obviously does, but <laughs> you are going to give the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>